Nanaya Mahuta is the minister responsible for steering the controversial Three Waters legislation through Parliament. At the same time as Foreign Minister, she is walking a diplomatic and trade tightrope with China and leading our response to the war in Ukraine. Tensions escalated there this week after missiles killed two people in Poland. So I asked the minister whether it was time for a negotiated settlement between Russia and Ukraine. Well, of course, New Zealand would support... Uh, Firstly, de-escalation of the current situation and a negotiated settlement, but the two key parties are, are quite fundamental to achieve that outcome. But if you support that, that means that Ukraine would have to lose some territory. Well, it's a matter for Ukraine and Russia to discuss. Obviously, uh, it's important that those two parties can see their way through. It doesn't look like any time soon there will be a de-escalation or a negotiated settlement. But we can, we can hope for that, we can advocate for that. So in the meantime, is it New Zealand's position to support Ukraine to fight as long as Ukraine wants to? New Zealand's position has been clear right from the beginning. Uh, Russia's illegal, unprovoked, unjust war in Ukraine contravenes international law. Uh, we support Ukraine uh, to defend itself, its sovereignty and territorial integrity. And we've been very consistent all the way through and that's why we've taken the actions we've taken alongside the international community mm. to ensure uh, that those long-held conventions in terms of international law are not contravened in that part of the world and indeed in our part of the world either. You have said that New Zealand's support of Ukraine is a reflection of our values and that rules-based order you talk about. Will you express those values in the same way if China invades Taiwan? Well, we're very consistent in terms of being a country of our size and upholding international law, the rules and norms mm. uh, that regulate and keep peace and prosperity in our region. Because this is not hypothetical. President Xi has said he won't rule out using force in Taiwan. Well, we can only deal with what's in front of us at this stage. We are plea our plea is that all states observe international uh, rules and norms uh, and we uphold those rules and norms to keep peace and, uh, and prosperity and stability in our region. Can you explain to us exactly what New Zealand's One China policy is? It was a policy that was agreed to some time ago, well before I, I was um, a member of parliament. Mm. And it does observe uh, the long-standing relationship that New Zealand has uh, and recognition uh, of uh, China uh, and their interests. Um, in terms of our relationship to Taiwan, we, we recognise uh, the uh, economy uh, of uh, Chinese Taipei. We have a, an agreement, an economic agreement uh, there, uh, but in terms of our overall relationship, that, are, that is within the context of our One China policy. Right, but I still don't understand, what does the One China policy mean to New Zealand? Do we recognise China's claims over Taiwan? We recognise that there, there are territorial uh, matters in relation to China's interests, but that hasn't prevented New Zealand uh, having an economic relationship with uh, Chinese Taipei. They're included within the APEC economies. And we also have a special and unique relationship, I think it's chapter 19, mm. where we recognise the indigenous economy, and that's very bespoke to New Zealand. So, so we're trying to have it both ways. We're trying to trade with everybody, but just keep China on side diplomatically. Well, we've had a free trade agreement with China for some time now. Uh, and uh, it has opened up opportunities to a number of New Zealand exporters who, c who continue uh, to that particular set of arrangements yeah, so does that uh, and, trade, and are benefiting from Does it. that trade inhibit New Zealand from taking the side of Taiwan should it be invaded by China? Not at all, and we can't speak in hypotheticals. We have to look at the now, and the situation right now is that we uh, continue but to work. But it's not hypothetical, well, is it? Because we to President Xi does the areas, say that he will use force. We continue to work with China in the areas uh, such as uh, economic trade and activity under the FTA. We continue to express our concerns in areas where they contravene our values. We are consistent, predictable, and respectful partners with China. We've been asking you about human rights violations against the Uyghur community in China for a long time. What are you doing now that we don't know about? Is there any further action? Well, we're continuing to work alongside uh, like-minded uh, partners in relation to human rights 
uh, abuses that have occurred. We've called for an unfettered uh, investigation. We've acknowledged uh, the report that Michelle Bachelet has uh, put out just mm. before she left office. Many of those recommendations fall to China to take action. And we've observed... So we've done as much as we can? We continue to work alongside international partners and bring those issues to light. And we have it as a standing agenda item as we engage with China at all levels. Earlier this year, you said that you would be stewarding through an autonomous sanctions bill that would allow New Zealand to sanction countries outside the UN system. What has happened to that? What I said is that I would be looking at the context of an autonomous sanctions bill within uh, our human rights values and aspirations. So right now, uh, the CE uh, is, uh, has a, a, an expert group that he's the established, CE of... the CE of MFAT, right. has an expert group that he uh, has established and will be taking advice from their considerations. So it is under development? Uh, I, won't, I won't go to that degree to say an autonomous sanctions bill is under development. Further consideration about the context for an autonomous sanctions bill and how that might reflect New Zealand's values and interests is certainly that would under, give... uh, under consideration. It would give New Zealand flexibility to sanction someone like Iran. Well, what we want as an alternative to an autonomous sanctions regime is for all states and parties to uphold international rules. Yeah, but and not all states and parties do, do it, that. It is so very difficult. It is, it is very difficult. And that is uh, in the context of Russia and Ukraine. We initiated the Russia Sanctions Act. That is uh, a live uh, area of experience now where we can see how sanctions are playing their part on the broader question of an autonomous sanctions regime. I'll consider that once it, once the panel comes back with the context that we might uh, go down that particular what track. What is the time frame for that discussion? I mean, when are you hoping to get that briefing back from MFAT? Uh, I think I'm hopeful that um, before the first quarter of next year. But the, it'll take as long as it takes. We're in some very difficult and challenging times. We do have a sanctions uh, regime in place. Uh, we have learnt a lot. Uh, since the establishment of that regime. Let's turn to Three Waters, the controversial Three Waters proposal. 88,000 select committee submissions, opposition from ACT, National, even the Greens. A lot of councils, most councils don't want it, yet it's poised to become law next week. Have you been listening? Yeah, look, of those 88,000 submissions, 82,000 of them were form submissions. Uh, and, which uh, means what? Well, which means they were all pretty much the same and they were probably a page long. Uh, and uh, saying all the same things. So let's put into context the substance of the submissions. The Select Committee uh, did an analysis of around about the 7,000 odd submissions and the content, subject matter, mm. and then uh, undertook to hear a number of them, travelled around the country, uh, and then gathered all of that information to consider the workability of the bill that was before them. Yeah. And I welcome their considerations. Right, so you're saying you are listening? You're we saying... are listening. The select committee process is an opportunity to listen yeah. and engage with the legislation that is currently in front of uh, so Parliament. The, so the tweaks that came out of the select committee finding did not change the co-governance model? No, and, and neither were there a substantial number of submissions, to my knowledge, that advocated for that. Uh, and so it's important to put into context the issues that were of most import uh, in the submissions uh, that the Select Committee heard. Which were what? what Which were about that? strengthening governance provisions, local voice, ensuring greater transparency and accountability, making sure that big communities weren't overshadowing the interests of smaller communities. Those were but some of the areas of focus that mm. came out through the submissions. So you're saying the co-governance issue wasn't an issue? Well, my understanding from the analysis of the submissions, it wasn't as high a priority issue for submitters as mm. it has been in the public domain and certainly in the debate in the House. The basis for all of this, you say, is to get scale to fix the pipes for New Zealand. In Auckland, the biggest water entity, that's already happening. So why are you pushing that through up here? Yeah, it is already happening, and that's the point. It's happening. It has shown some advantages, but there are still constraints in the water care scenario in terms of having a tied balance sheet to the Auckland City Council. So if we take water care as a really good example of some of the benefits you can get from scale and aggregation, it is not happening in other parts of the country. So we need to learn 
uh, from that model and ensure that those, uh, those benefits happen more even-handedly around the whole country for big communities and, and small communities alike. Mm. But the new Auckland Mayor, Wayne Brown, wants to keep water care as it is. Well, we did a thorough analysis of the constraints on water care, and right now uh, the constraints are uh, uh, water care cannot continue to fund to the degree that is necessary for a, a city the size of Auckland. It's had to defer a number of programs uh, by about two to three years because of a tied balance sheet with Auckland City Council. So well, the council is pushing back on that, and they say that the figures you're putting out there about the potential rate rises, should this not happen, are wrong. Well, those those forecasts come from Watercare themselves in okay, terms so of their forecast over the next 10 mm. years about what will be required to fund the ongoing pressure to invest in and, infrastructure. And in you're Auckland. right, their figures show 7% going up to 9.5% and then dropping away once the investment is done. There's a lot of assumptions that are built into that as well. And part of that assumption is that in the future, government will continue to contribute uh, to the infrastructure mm. challenge that Auckland is facing. And what we're providing through these reforms is a solution that takes the pressure off council balance sheets, but mm. also enables us to leverage on scale. I'll just finish on Auckland. Are you accusing Wayne Brown of spreading disinformation about the rate rises? We have a different view about uh, how to secure the greatest um, uh, benefits possible in terms of water reform. Are you saying that Watercare's predicted rate rises of 7 and 9.5% would disappear or be reduced should three waters come into play? Should three waters come into play, and in Auckland in particular, we will only benefit from the current experience of water care, further aggregation and the ability to further invest. you can't guarantee that those invest. rate rises will go down though. Well actually we, we can guarantee that there will be long term resilience across a bigger area as a result of the reforms. Three Waters has been a really unpopular divisive issue and it's been a big expenditure of your political capital. How damaging has it been to Labor? Well let's be really clear and people need to focus on what are the issues at heart here clean drinking water, better environmental outcomes, affordable costs for ratepayers now going forward into the future when we know that there's been huge compromises in investing in infrastructure. We want better cities mm. and quality of mm. life. And Those are the real issues. And nobody's arguing that, though, are they? Actually, nobody's they are. The contrary argument that has been put up by a number of uh, advocates who do not want reform is that it's about ownership, it's about assets, and it's no one's talking about actually the the cost on ratepayers. Everybody seems to and agree that the pipes need to be fixed, it's just your model of fixing it has caused the division. This isn't my model, this is our model that will keep our children safe now going forward into the future. Politically has it been worth it? You know what, it should have been done probably 20 years ago. A reshuffle could be on the cards, would you want to get rid of this local government portfolio now? I think local government's an exciting space. There's so much happening that affects the daily lives of everyday New Zealanders, but in order for local government to operate effectively, this significant challenge in the area of infrastructure does need to be dealt with. Do you want to keep the local government portfolio or would you like to hand it off to Kieran McAnulty? Oh look, having Kieran is a fantastic uh, addition to the portfolio in terms of the insights that he brings from his communities. I'll do whatever the Prime Minister asks me to do. What I do know is that this particular reform was needed 20 years ago and it is so necessary. Nanaima Huda, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.